Welcome to the Backpacking Light podcast, where we discuss the philosophy and skills of lightweight backcountry travel so you can experience the outdoors with more comfort, safety, and enjoyment. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And today's podcast is a tech short about StoveBench. StoveBench is the testing protocol that we've developed in an effort to create standardized stove performance metrics. And that's something we'll dig into here in a second. We're pretty excited about it, and we hope it becomes a valuable contribution to the backpacking community. So Ryan, why don't you just give us a brief overview of what StoveBench is and what it does, and then I'll jump into why we felt the need to develop it in the first place. So at at its core, StoveBench is a testing protocol that we can use to determine with a very high degree of reproducibility two important backpacking stove performance features, power and efficiency. Then we roll these metrics up into a single quantifiable performance factor that we call the stove bench score. So before going on too too far, I want to make sure that we define what we mean by power and we define what we mean by efficiency. So power can be described in a couple of different ways. The most common way for a, a user to understand power is through boil times. So it's the amount of time it takes a stove to boil some volume of water. And that's going to be related to a number of different stove design features, the size of the burner head, the power of the flame, you know, the the actual robustness of the flame and its resistance to wind and things like that, the energy content of the fuel, how much fuel is flowing to the burner and being combusted and the efficiency of fuel combustion at the burner head. So all these things affect the BTU output of the stove and influence its power and its ability to deliver heat to the water. The other factor we're looking at is efficiency. Now in defining efficiency, there's a couple ways to look at this. There's a few definitions floating around out there. We're interested in exploring two means of efficiencies here. One is the efficiency of a stove to completely combust the fuel so that it converts the fuel to as much heat as possible. And then the other aspect of efficiency is kind of a system efficiency, and it has to do with the the stove, the windscreen, the pot combo, everything. And it's really how much of the heat from the fuel can be transferred to heating the water in the pot. So the goal of StoveBench is to measure and collect the data we need to get a good handle on power and efficiency. Right. And what led to the creation of StoveBench was that when we were researching our gear guide and we started to compare stoves, we realized that there were a lot of variables that weren't being taken into account when we started looking at the data that was provided by the manufacturer. So we realized that things like the ambient temperature of the lab where the tests were being run was could be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. The elevation of the place that the tests were being run, the amount of fuel inside of the testing canisters, the size, the shape, and material of the pots that were being used to provide this data, uh, the temperature of the water before boiling. So that, that's just too much to really start comparing boil times on different stoves and it actually mean anything. So we we really wanted to create a system that could standardize as much of that as possible and that could be replicated by BPL stove testers all over the world. So in addition to this protocol, we've created a set of instructions that allow testers to run this protocol for themselves and then share that data with the ultralight community. Yeah, and I I think this, this was key in developing the protocol was we wanted to standardize a a test system so that we could at first create a, a controlled test environment that we could get basic fuel consumption and boil time tests for and realize that that's not going to describe a stove's performance in great detail you know you run these tests on a bench in indoors with a certain volume of water using a certain type of pot, using a certain starting and ending temperature. And that's not necessarily representative of what happens in the field. But the goal with creating this first control number is that we can then tweak the system and start studying all sorts of different things, larger water volumes, different pots, 
the use of a windscreen, the addition of wind, colder ambient temperatures, things like that. But you got to have a reproducible, controlled test environment first so that you can get baseline data. And this is where it's really difficult to go to a retail shop and see a comparison table of backpacking stoves that report manufacturer boil times and canister burn rates and things like that, because they're they're often created in such wildly different test environments that they're probably not as comparable as you think they are. Right. So how does stove bench actually work? Can you give us the nuts and bolts? Well, let's let's walk through a control boil test. So basically what we're doing is and and we'll talk about upright canister stoves today, but the stove bench protocol has been adapted for all different stove types and we'll be able to uh, publish those protocols as we start um, investigating those stoves. But we're going to talk about upright canister stoves first. So we're using a, a certain type of canister with a certain fuel mixture that's very commonly available and one that we know has a high level of gas purity in it. It's a mixture of 80% isobutane, 20% propane. It uses the eight ounce or 227 gram net canisters. So we're starting with that. You affix a canister stove to the top of that canister. You're letting this equilibrate to the room temperature so that you're starting with a canister temperature that is at room temperature. For water, we have a a 0.85 liter titanium pot that has a fairly wide base. And we're adding 500 milliliters of ice water to it with no ice in it. So the, the water is you know, around zero degrees Celsius to start. Um, It's usually, you know, between zero and two, something like that. And then we're going to heat that water up to the boiling point, which of course is going to differ depending on your elevation. But the goal here is to heat water over a wide temperature range at two very controllable temperatures, freezing and boiling. So we're, we're looking at a, you know, 90 to 100 degrees of heating there. So We're measuring the weight of the stove and canister to get a starting weight of the fuel. We're measuring that system weight at the end of the test so that we can determine the amount of fuel that's consumed. And we're monitoring the temperature throughout the test using a thermocouple. So when I was developing this test, one thing I I noticed, especially with the at-home testing community, is that instrumentation has a pretty big impact on the quality of your results, especially when it comes to weighing the system and determining the weight of the fuel. So we're using a scale uh, that's an industrial scale that has a resolution of a tenth of a gram. We're using industrial thermometers that have resolution to a tenth of a degree C. And those two things alone have a huge impact on Uh, the quality of your results and your ability to reproduce them. And what it really means is that you can do fewer replicates to get good data. So in in my lab here at home, I may have to do two or three test tops to get very highly reproducible data that's, you know, within an error rate range of two to two to four percent where in someone else's lab where they're using consumer grade scales and thermometers, uh, they might have to repeat a test four to six times to get accurate results and something that's a believable number. So we're running these boil tests. We're, we're determining the fuel consumption and we're determining boil times um, in our tests. And then because we've collected temperature data, because we've weighed the amount of water we're using in the test, and because we've got very accurate weights of fuel consumption, we can then calculate a whole host of things that go into stove performance accurately. Things like a stove's efficiency, its gross wattage, its stove bench score, which is our metric for evaluating the performance of a stove based on power and efficiency, things like that. So you can pull an enormous amount of data out of here and um, use it to evaluate and compare stove performance. So we published the stove bench protocol in early January, and we had a lot of great feedback, but also some questions. So we'd like to address those questions here. 
The first one was, what pot size, shape, and material did you use as a stove bench baseline, and what are the possible ramifications of that choice? So a lot of ultralight backpackers use mugs or mug-like pots that are tall and skinny. They have a low diameter. They're not the most efficient cooking mechanisms because uh, it's there's not a high surface area. There's not a large diameter to deliver heat through. And so we wanted to select a pot that was a little bit wider than that. And then we'll evaluate these, these skinny pots later on. But um, the choice of the pot for our standard protocol is something that gives a wider base so that the diameter of the pot is not going to be a severely limiting factor into the stove's performance when we do the control test. We chose titanium over, say, steel or aluminum because titanium is becoming the gold standard in backpacking cookware. And it's it's far and away the most popular option among our community, which is who this protocol is primarily for. In terms of uh, the pot size, most of our community uh, tends to cook solo. And so their normal uh, cooking volume is somewhere between eight and 16 ounces. I chose 16 ounces because I think this is the most common amount of water that you are normally cooking at, for example, a dinner meal. Now, most of the packaged freeze-dried meals that I use require about 12 ounces of water. And I've seen others kind of standardize their home boil tests on 12 ounces. I always make a little bit, a little bit more water because uh, that 12 ounces is... Um, often not enough to rehydrate my meal effectively, even when the instructions say that. I think the instructions will have that on there for ideal conditions that are warm and things like that. But I always find myself adding a few more ounces beyond what the manufacturer rep recommends because I either want my dinner a little bit soupy or I prefer to have everything hydrated and sometimes it takes a little more water than that. So I find myself typically boiling 16 ounces of water at a batch. In the morning, that fits my cooking style as well because I might use eight ounces for oatmeal and eight ounces for a cup of coffee or something. So we're, we're standardizing on a 16 ounce uh, boil volume. So you mentioned this a little bit earlier in the pod, but um, maybe we can dig into it here. Can stove bench be applied to other types of stoves, specifically ultralight stoves like wood burning stoves or alcohol stoves? Absolutely. I've I've uh, applied the protocol for all the different stoves that I have here, um, and I'm using it on wood. I'm in the process of kind of fine tuning the wood burning protocol using uh, just pellet fuel. And uh, it's, it's remarkably repeatable. So I'm really excited to, to bring a wood burning protocol to, to backpacking light soon as well, as soon as I iron out the, the kinks associated with that. And then, you know, I've applied it to Esbit and alcohol and um, we're running integrated stove system tests right now. So things like the MSR reactor and jet boil and, and whatnot. And uh, the protocol needs tweaked for each different fuel type so that those tests are standardized as well. Uh, but uh, it's, it's generating some great data. So I'm excited to actually uh, be able to publish some of these figures for the different stove types. And this is where I think it has some potential to be a very useful educational tool because you can assign a stove bench score, which is this ratio of uh, the output of a stove divided by the input of energy that goes into the, the stove test and get a really neat feel for how wood compares to solid fuel, compares to alcohol, compares to mm. canister gas. And, and then you can massage that data further based on the stove system weights because these stove systems all have different weights. And you can create these elaborate graphs that allow you to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go backpacking for eight days. I am boiling this amount of water per meal. This is the number of meals per day I have that I need boiled water for. And you can see how each of these different stove types performs in each of these scenarios. And it's a, 
it's at it at its base. It's a very useful educational tool to help you understand how stoves behave, and it can be a good decision making tool based on your needs for a particular trip as well. Won't elevation skew the results? This is one of the questions we had a lot on the forum. Um, and one one writer said, in order to get a better stove bench score, couldn't you just hike up a mountain? Elevation changes primarily the boil temperature of water. So if you look at the boiling temperature of water at sea level, it's 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. I live at 7,200 feet. So my water boils at around 92 degrees Celsius, substantially cooler. And the stove bench protocol is is pretty neat because it it does not matter what the beginning and ending temperature of the water is. It it calculates a, a performance score based on what the measured starting and ending temperature of the water is. So rather than being too concerned about what temperature your water boils at, um, just knowing the starting and ending temperature of your water is far more critical. And this is where um, kind of user-generated boil tests are sometimes hard to interpret because the boil time test that I perform at 7,200 feet is going to look very different than somebody who's performing the same test in Seattle at sea level. And um, our numbers could be substantially different but we just claim that this is the time to boil. I would argue that time to boil isn't as relevant as the change in temperature that you're actually measuring during your boil test. In the stove bench protocol, one of the things that you do is you run the stoves wide open at full throttle. Can you talk about why you made this choice and maybe get into one of the questions was, aren't stoves more efficient when you run them below full throttle? So how does that affect the testing and the scores? You have to start with something that's repeatable. I have a series of tests that I performed on a needle valve canister stove where I opened the the valve handle some number of rotational degrees off of its off position and ran multiple tests through the valve's entire range of motion. And so what I found was that the repeatability of running a valve partially open is very, very difficult. And some of these stoves have needle valves that are so sensitive that you get substantially different boil times or fuel consumption rates, even if the valve is five or 10 degrees different. And that five or 10 degrees is, is a pretty hard level of precision to dial in by eye. We, I used a, a digital protractor to actually precisely dial this in, but you can't do this in the field, right? So you have to start somewhere with a repeatable known number and Wide open is is the best way to do that. Now, wide open causes some problems when a canister is completely full. So we drain the canisters a bit down to at least 80% of their fuel capacity. And we have another series of data, and that's that's available in the Stowbench article, that shows that between a canister's capacity of 30% to 80%, results are quite repeatable when a fuel valve is held wide open. Now, Is a wide open fuel valve the best way to run a stove in the field? The answer is no, because it it tends to waste a lot of fuel that is not necessary. But again, the purpose of this protocol is to develop this first baseline control number, and then we can study what's going on and further tests after that. And in the forum attached to the stove bench article, I published some data later on that shows the effects that... Uh, the fuel throttle has on power output, efficiency, the stove bench score, things like that. So yes, it definitely has an impact, but we're going to start with full throttle because that's a very repeatable way to do it. The last question we have is basically, what's the point here? I mean, are, are we just creating something for the the um, scientifically minded people on our forum to argue about, or are we creating something that is going to be of help to the average backpacker in making a stove choice. If we stop here with with boil tests, 
and just rank stoves with this arbitrary stove bench score. Uh, we've done nothing other than an academic exercise. The, the real utility I see is being able to subject stoves to adverse environments, cold temperatures, um, some wind, larger water volumes, the things that really challenge stoves. And that's where I think you're going to see a large degree of differentiation between various stoves out there. You can run boil tests on your kitchen counter until the cows come home, but it's not going to give you the type of valuable data that you need to make a decision on whether a stove is going to work in the conditions that you're going to put it in. Now, I would argue that for for most of us backpacking in the summer when it's warm and and the conditions are mild, most stoves are going to work just fine. But when the conditions become more challenging, uh, as your as your water volume needs go up, as the environment becomes more inclement, then you're going to see some differentiation in in not only different stove types but different models of stoves within those stove type classes. And I think once we start uh, throwing uh, some challenging, adverse stove testing conditions at these stoves, and then studying how they perform under those conditions, that's really where it's at for me. Well, we do have one last question, which is what are some of the other potential flaws with the protocol and what can we do about them? I think the biggest flaw is believing that a score or a number that's generated from a stove test, whether it's boil time, fuel consumption, or the stove bench score, believing that that one number or two numbers tells the whole story of stove performance, that's the risk. That's the limitation of this protocol. So that someone is going to take one of these numbers and say, oh, this is the best stove. There's so much that goes into someone's decision to build a cook kit um, around a stove system. And they may have preferences for various fuel types that uh, aren't told by the stove bench score alone. And so there's a risk that you get tunnel vision in believing that these boil test numbers control your decision-making process. Well, Ryan, thanks for walking us through this. This is all going to be very helpful when we do our long stove episode, and we'll dig into some of the more science and and, uh, performance metrics in that episode. But for now, that is going to do it for this episode of the BPL podcast. We'll definitely put a link to the stove bench protocol in the show notes if you'd like to give it a read for yourself. Also, make sure to read the forum and and the discussion that happened along with the publication of that article. And also make sure you've subscribed to the pod so you don't miss our long episode on canister stoves. If you like what you heard or you have suggestions for different segments, let us know at podcast at backpackinglight.com. You can download the show notes for this episode by visiting backpackinglight.com slash podcast. If you want to learn more about Stove Bench, you can go to backpackinglight.com slash stovebench. And this podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Leave us a review. It helps other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one party message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody.